Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Get Into It with Gila. I'm Gila Glassberg, registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. And today I have Rachel Goodman. Hi, Rachel. Hey, who are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Can you tell the listeners where do you live and what do you do? Absolutely. So um, as Gila said, I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. I also practice with the intuitive eating approach. Um, I help basically what that is, is helping women really eat with uh, trust and get rid of all the guilt and the stress around food, really trust themselves and their bodies to nourish themselves with confidence and feel good. Um, So they can really live life fully, like empty out all that like stressful space in your mind right now with like food and how am I eating? What am I eating? Like, I'm going to overeat. I'm going to binge eat. I'm going to restrict like all that noise, be able to put that away, really feel comfortable with food, trust yourself to eat in a way that feels good. So you can actually go about living your life and within your life's purpose and what you're here to do, right? What you're meant to do with your life. Um, I am located in, in Brooklyn, New York, um, but really like kind of all over the world these days, cause we do everything virtually, mm-hmm. um, but that is where I'm from. So it's pretty much what I do in a nutshell. Awesome. So I feel like we're connected cause we kind of do the same thing, which is awesome. And, yeah. it's- and you're also from New York, right? I live in New York, but I am live in New, York. New York. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's still something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sometimes when I hear you speak, I'm like, did I say that? <laughs> like, I feel like we're like so connected, you know? Yeah. Um, sure. So did you always know you wanted to be a dietitian? Um, nope. 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 I'm trying to think like, when does always know, like from high school? I don't know. Where does that like start? I didn't ever have any aspiration really to have a career believe it or not, like in high school. Meaning you wanted to be like a stay-at-home mom type? Yeah, that was like my dream. I was like, I'm gonna get married, have kids. Like that, I think it's also like Mm -hmm. how you you were, oh, how I was raised, you know? Your mom Um, was a stay-at-home mom? My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And she had times where she worked here and there, but she was mostly stay-at-home mom. And that was, and it's also kind of like the mindset you're kind of taught in growing up, you know, like family, kids, uh, that's like, it's not like you can't work. You can't do a job. I mean, all our teachers were women, so clearly you right. could, right? right? But, um, but, it, but the, 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 what was like, the focus was the home and the kids. And so for me, it was always about, I'm going to grow up and have kids and that's going to be like my thing. It wasn't like, I'm not going to have a job, but I didn't really think about it. Um, and then it was, I graduated and I think I just started to, from high school, And then at some point I just started to, because I was single and didn't get married right away as like I thought I would, right? And again, for anyone who's listening, who's like not Jewish Orthodox, like it's it's more of like a mentality of how you're raised. But um, so for me, it was like normal to all graduate high school and do the, you know, the gap year of like seminary, the day studies, whatever. And then- Did you go to seminary? I went to seminary, yeah. I went to seminary in Tzfat for a year. It was amazing. Don't remember was much awesome. of what I learned. I just remember all like the food and yeah. the traveling, which by the way, is also another thing of the struggle with food and binge eating. And like Israel was definitely like, I had such an incredible year, but definitely, definitely the struggle with food was like that cloud. Like it would have been so much better. And I would have enjoyed the food so much more if I wasn't constantly worrying about my body size and binge eating. And you're really in a diet culture bubble when you're in seminary because everybody's just talking about like don't have not put on weight and this diet and that diet I clearly remember like which which girls were on what diet and me trying different things and then just being like forget it and then it's like 1 a.m in the morning and I'm eating like toasted chocolate sandwiches mm-hmm. which is something that's normal for Israelis to eat <laughs> here it's like oh yeah you know totally. um, and I remember also being like not hungry and I'm like why am I eating this at 1 a.m but like diet starts tomorrow. So I have to eat it all, which like never panned out. Um, So definitely, I think it's also part of why I'm so passionate about helping women make peace with food and stop feeling so chaotic because I have so much of my own personal experience where food, I love food so much, but at the same time, I was also at war with food and with my body. And it did hijack so many things in my life that I could have experienced so much more fully um, if food was just a peaceful part of my life. And so anyway, um, when I got back from seminary, I kind of did uh, another year of, I was like a dorm counselor. I did the curriculum for like the girls in high school and stuff. And then I, and then I started working at a doctor's office as a med- like the receptionist. 
and some medical assisting stuff. And then I just like, honestly, I, my brain just needed stimulation. I'm like, I need to do something more than this. Let's go to college. Like mm-hmm. I was actually going to do culinary school, but I missed the deadline to apply. So I'm like, okay, let me just do college instead. And then if I'm already going to college, it's going to be nutrition. Cause I was thinking about nutrition for a while. I was thinking about nutrition for at least like a year before. And the thing is, as much as I was on diets for years and years, like high school and stuff, there was something about it that fascinated me more than just about body science. Cause I really did think it was genuinely so cool, you know, how food impacts our health and the nutrition part of it. And I also love to eat and food. And so it was a combination of so many things where I was like, okay, if I'm going to go to college and learn like a career degree or something like that, um, it's going to be nutrition. And so mm-hmm. I went to college and learned to be um, I became a dietitian, registered dietitian. And um, how much of this journey, like, I'm not sure what else, like, am I giving the whole full scope of the journey or like what sure. do you have questions in between? I do have a question actually. So, so seminary, it sounds like it was like a culmination of like the fog, like the diet culture fog, like you said, like the cloud following you around, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. But before then, like in high school, you were already like on the diet bandwagon. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. So, okay. If we're, we're going to go there. So, um, when I was, I would say my earliest negative body image thought, and the reason I'm bringing body image into this is because think about why you struggle with food. Mm-hmm. You know, for most people, the struggle with food starts with something, not, not being happy with your body size. And so that kind of, I think the earliest negative thought for me about my body, I was like nine. That's my earliest thought that I ever had um that's very young that's very young and common but very young yeah that's when I remember not like like consciously remember not liking my size and not liking myself in as a result like kind of it's it's related we put so Mm -hmm. much of that self-worth in our body size from Mm -hmm. such a young age and so do you remember the like impetus that led you to the bad yeah well first of all um it started at the doctor's office where I was weighed and the doctor said my weight out loud. And I didn't think too much. I did think it was like, wow, that's a big number because it wasn't a big number. It's just when you're little, any number is a big number. If it's more than 20, you know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, But I didn't think too much of it. I was like, wow, it's a big number, but okay. And then in, it was nine, nine years old. So it was fourth grade. Girls were saying how much they weigh out loud. And everyone was saying like, oh my God, that's so little. Oh my God, that's so much. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Like you can realize how invasive diet culture is where kids are talking about this. Yeah. This was like a conversation for nine-year-olds, which is insane. And so everyone was saying like their number. And of course, well, the girl who had the lowest number was like, everyone was like, oh my God. Like mm-hmm. it's something where you're not saying, wow, it's so great. But in the tone that you can sense, like everyone was like, the, the lower you weighed, the more it was like, well, oh my God so little like mm-hmm. it was like a positive thing mm-hmm. in our subconscious right. and then I said my number and this girl uh looked at me and she was like what you weigh that much like a lot I was like yeah and then she like looks me up and down and she's like oh yeah yeah okay you know and it, it's less That's about sad. the specific words but more about the tone and the messages you're the getting. body language body language exactly and so then that was the First time I think I remember feeling like some sort of shame about my size. And then after that, I think it was um, a year later, I saw a picture of myself. And I was like, it was at like a certain angle. And I was like, that's me? That like, it was like, again, that shameful moment. And that's kind of basically where, where it was that it wasn't all consuming or anything like that. But then when I was 11 years old, it was kind of that moment where I was like, I'm sick of this type thing, which I think a lot of adults can relate to too, where it's like, that's it doing something about this you know um and so I was like I understood at that age that eating less equals weight loss I don't even know how I understood it but I resolved to stop eating snacks at recess wow at 11 at 11 yeah I remember I was like I'm just not gonna eat snacks at recess and it wasn't anything extreme you know thankfully yeah I I'm not like I, I wasn't predispositioned for an eating disorder But for many kids who are like genetically and have that family history, something just like cutting out snacks can, can spiral into an eating disorder. But thankfully that wasn't my just genetic predisposition, but it did lead to a lot of disordered eating eventually. But I cut out the snacks at lunch. 
uh, not lunch at at recess and then i don't i don't i didn't even notice the weight loss itself but i started getting compliments from people like oh you got so thin or whatever and the thing is looking back i think it had more to do with me gaining height because it's normal to put on weight between like the years i was struggling like i started to struggle with body image were the years where it's normal to put on weight like hormonally mm-hmm. for children right, right. um and then it happened to be that the years the the time i was starting to get compliments it might have a little to do with the snacks. I think it had more to do with like me gaining height suddenly. Right. This is in retrospect, like looking back, right. right? Right. But anyway, that's when I was like, oh, okay, felt good. And then that just like, I'm not going to go through every diet I did because we're going to be here for like five days mm-hmm. straight. Right. <laughs> like, you know? right. Right. But definitely, definitely for years and years and years throughout my whole high school, you know, there were just so many different types of diets, like the books. Um, can I, can I mention types of diets? Yeah, sure. Know, kind of, like there was- were just, you- like, like, were your friends also all doing this or this was oh, like, for sure. were you like known as like the diet queen? No, you know? no, I wasn't a diet queen. I think the diet queens were the ones who were bigger yeah. and lost a significant amount of weight. And so they're the queen. Cause like, well, it worked for them. Right, right. Or, or there were the ones who would endlessly diet and never lose the weight. Right. Who, um, looking back, like it, it, knowing them and their family, that body diversity, right? Like right. they are just not going to be in that body size because genetically they're right. larger bodies but right. it's so sad looking back because I remember like there were th- a few girls who would always have rice cake and crackers uh rice cake and carrot sticks mm-hmm. and just they were never ever thin right uh, but then there were the people definitely who like lost a lot of weight and like talking about all the you know she would I remember this one girl would talk about how she would pretty much just have soup all day and how she lost the weight from that and like there was this admiration around it and just thinking back it's so insane mm-hmm. um but definitely literally so many people were a lot of girls in high school were were dieting for sure I was definitely in that culture I remember it was like a cool thing like it became cool to like have apples for a snack right. there would be like a big carton of apple and people would just mm-hmm. be like eating apples mm-hmm. <laughs> for a snack and um yeah yeah definitely throughout high school so that lasted through high school was that also like reinforced like at home or like amongst your siblings, your parents? I don't know how much. So I'm know. the oldest. I'm uh-huh. the oldest. Um, and yeah, there were definitely like things at home in the sense that my mother was, it was never like in an extreme way, but there was, de- and I think it was also because that's what my parents knew. That's what a lot mm-hmm. of people know, right? It didn't right. come from like a, I think right. parents, if parents knew the harm, they wouldn't do it. Right. For um, sure. Yeah, but definitely I remember my mother doing kind of like a Weight Watchers type of thing, Richard Simmons. Um, do you know Richard Simmons? No. Okay, but it's fine. You don't need to know him. He's definitely it up. like diet, <laughs> diet culture guy. Um, but she did kind of like this Richard Simmons program. And then she even like, I remember constantly at the, to the point where my mother was like, just stop asking me. Like, I'd be like, did I get me? Did I get me? Kind of like, mm-hmm. Especially after a binge, I'd be so stressed. Mm-hmm. And um, at, I think in 11th grade, she just gave me like, this like encouraging, inspiring diet book Mm -hmm. to read, which like I did think was so encouraging and inspiring, which wasn't by the way, extreme in any way. It wasn't like cut out a full food group. It was very like, you know, Weight Watchers, how they try to show things balanced. It was kind of like that style, but yeah, it was definitely um, um, some sort of narrative in my home. My mother Mm -hmm. had, I've seen her on a diet. Mm -hmm. Um, My father was also very into like, you know, being a certain weight mm-hmm. um yeah so that was definitely present in my house there wasn't any reason there wasn't any narrative in my home which was like in opposition to the world it was very much like dieting it's totally normal to like right. want to lose weight so um yeah there was I think for me though it came more from media from media and from my peers but I think the main one for me personally was media like mm-hmm. I remember watching The Little Mermaid when I was five, wanting to look like her. Mm-hmm. And wow. she, like, if anyone looks like her in real life, they'd be like initiated. Like it's right. not normal. But all right. Disney princesses, if you look at them, it's like they're so real thin. It's not even achievable. Right. Um. But I think the main influence, personally, for me was from the media and like Disney stuff. I actually sure. just read that in in the binge eat, eating disorder book, which I don't have in my office. It's upstairs, but I'll I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I think she said that the average American woman is like 140 pounds and like five, three, something like that. Size 12, size 12. 
That's 12, I think, is the average size. And, and uh, the models are like 5, 8, and 116. Like, that's the average. They would not be healthy in real life. And the thing is, right. is that I'm like, nowadays, it's it's still problematic, but at least there's some diversity right. in the movies we see with body right. sizes right. better than it has been. The conversation you know, has started. Yeah. In the 90s, though, it was like they all, like the women all looked like rail thin, the same same mm -hmm. color skin like it was always just that same stereotype and most people can't look like that but when they're portrayed as the heroine or the one that everybody wants or there was, there's always I'm sure everyone at some point in their life watched that movie where the girl is all frumpy usually with glasses and the hair is a mess mm -hmm. and um, maybe she's also much bigger and then over the summer she like gets contacts and gets a perm and loses mm -hmm. weight and comes to school and there's always this dramatic like you know, wind right. in her hair and then right. all the people right. will turn to her and it's like right. admiration. As a child, how are you not going to like get impacted right. by diet culture right. when the message is there, even if it's not outright, mm -hmm. it's like they're like your value. People will like you if you're small, which by the way, in reality, we're here to tell you it's not true, Right. <laughs> but that's like the culture right. that you come to believe in, especially right. as a child. Right. They're selling you like if you shrink your body, like your life, your your life will literally miraculously change and you'll have like a million friends and everyone will love you. And which is literally what I thought in high school, like right. as, as sad as it is looking back, I really did think that people would like me more. I thought I'd be more confident. I thought I'd be more popular. I thought I'd, you know, I, I really did think life would be better if I were small, which is really crazy because looking back on my pictures, even like it doesn't make sense to me because in your mind, you think you're so much bigger mm -hmm. in reality that for me, that wasn't true. That's right. why so much, I say so often, it's like, it's so much of it is a body image struggle. And it's right. so hard to believe because we see all this media mm -hmm. that makes us think it's not true, but it really is like, even those models themselves feel horribly about themselves, which is right. insane. Right. It really is an image issue. So I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I just thought of this. Uh if you do you take teen clients uh I only see 18 and older I don't see teens do you hear this from like let's say even your 18 year old clients like even from like a thing I've had clients? some teenagers I have worked with like very few teenagers um but my focus is 18 and up are you asking if I see see these like pressures from media and and pairs from teenagers like, like your story sounds pretty typical like like to me because I I see it a yeah. lot in my office. So like, is this something that you see a lot in your office? Like the same type of thing, like a, a teenager, even an 18 year old comes to you and like, you know, they've been exposed to diet culture and they are trying very hard to manipulate their weight. And even if they are in a smaller body, they just have internalized something's wrong with them because they can't. You for know, sure. For sure. So you don't even have to be a teenager for that because the thing is we've all been teenagers. So you can right. carry that into adulthood. Right. So the clients that I see who are, adults um for sure so much of it comes back to beliefs in childhood not everybody um you know so much of, so much of it comes to beliefs in childhood so much of it comes to what you know maybe parents have said or you know a client who did a diet with friends because the friends are doing it let's do it together it started out innocent but then what happens is like they lose the weight and then it's it's not the weight loss itself that's problematic because sometimes you know i'll have a client who's like i really just wanted to be healthier and so I really focused on habits and I happened to lose the weight, which let me just disclaimer, just because not, it, this won't happen to everyone. There are people who can make healthy behavior changes and will not lose weight. So you're not doing it wrong if you haven't lose weight, lost mm -hmm. weight. But it happened to be for this client, she made the behavior changes that, you know, made her body feel good and she was working out more and she just started by default losing the weight because that's what her body wanted. In and of itself, that's not an issue. The problem was that she's, for the first time in her life, she got so much recognition. And she got so many compliments and then it started to become its value system for her and like, oh, okay, like I have to keep this. I have to make sure mm -hmm. I lose this. And it just got more restrictive and more restrictive and more restrictive. And then it backlash into binge eating and then the mm -hmm. whole thing came avalanching, spiraling down into like, I can't live this way anymore. And so mm -hmm. sometimes it could just start out innocently, but so often it does come from like peer, from your peers, for sure. From like this acceptance part, like this, like this desire or need to be accepted and thinking you'll oh, get it sure. from weight loss right for sure for sure yeah right um okay so so that was you you became a registered dietitian so then then what happened you you were doing like weight 
weeks so, to yeah. So I became a registered dietitian. Um, I was still not aware of what intuitive eating is. I did kind of discover some of the principles on my own, like not knowing it was officially intuitive eating. Like I had the concept of like hunger and fullness. I, I never, even when I saw clients for weight loss, I would never encourage them to be hungry. I always encourage them to listen to their cues. Um, you know, definitely came to that body wisdom on my own, but there was still the piece of, you know, I need to lose weight, still need mm. to lose weight. And so mm. when clients would come to me, it was always still about um, go getting on the scale, seeing the number and- well, You started a private practice right away? I think I started it like, I'm just trying to, I, I'm actually presenting, an, uh, I'm presenting like a nutrition career journey path, like presentation to students tonight. And I went through, it's interesting because everything I'm telling you, I'm like, I'm going to be talking about this tonight. And I have like all the slides slides right now so I'm just trying to think a so moment cute. like when did I specifically start um um private practice pretty much right away yeah it was more like word of mouth type of thing like one two people it wasn't like this like private practice thing it was like they came to my living room in mm-hmm. my house <laughs> you know that's, is that what you wanted to do as a dietitian work, work I always work. wanted to do private practice I always wanted to do private practice um, and so I was doing weight loss at first it was in my living room. And then I did rent out a, like office space and it just, something didn't line up. Like, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes like if the client would, let's say lose the weight, lose like a pound or two, right. Whatever, however amount in that week, it would just be like, yay, happy, great. Awesome. Continue. There was no like conversation about how's your body feeling? Like what's going on with your day to day, right? Let's how, how do we keep this sustainable? All that. Um, and then, and then if they didn't lose weight or they stayed, if they stayed the same or even gained a pound that week, um, it was like confessional. It was Mm -hmm. guilt. It was the whole time. They're just feeling so badly about themselves and like, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And then a lot of times, you know, there were times where they would overeat or binge eat. And then at the time I didn't have the skills to know how to help them because I wasn't aware of intuitive eating. I didn't realize that restriction is what causes that. Mm -hmm. I did have the concept that if you deprive yourself a lot, you'll binge, Mm -hmm. but not to the extent that I did now. And so, you know, coach them through that. And then, and then, um, what's it called? And then sometimes I would look at how they're eating and they would be eating real from, from my perspective, nutrition and health. Right. And what I learned and studied, I'm like, you're eating well, no, but I didn't lose the weight. Mm -hmm but you're eating, you're, you're doing everything right. Mm-hmm. But they would still be so upset at themselves that they must be doing something wrong if they didn't lose the weight. And then to be honest, as a dietitian, I started to feel failure because I'm like, they're coming to me with a certain expectation of weight loss result and I'm not giving it to them. But at the same time, they're eating well. Mm-hmm. So like, and I refuse to ever make someone go hungry. That was right. like a line for me. So I always had that like intuitive sense but I still didn't, I still, I, they were still coming for weight loss at the end of the day. Right. Then, uh, and uh, like a, about, I guess I would say a few months later, a year later, not exactly sure, but like not that long later, I read the intuitive eating book. My friend actually told me about it. She saw it in today's dietitian magazine. She's like, did you hear about this book? It's so amazing. And I'm like, okay, let's, cause we were actually both, we were both dietitians and we were both still talking about our food struggles and stuff. Is it Miriam? Is it Miriam? Are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. She, yeah. Cause she always, yeah. Cause, yeah. I always talk about you. Like she's always, she's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we, uh, what's it called? We both like discovered that at the same time. And so, um, I read the book and it just made, by the way, let me just say initially when I read the book, I found, I found it super boring. Like it took yes. me a while to get into it. I was like, I don't want to read this. Like right. I read a chapter and closed it. Right. But then once you get into it, it was like, oh my gosh, this is making so much sense. Like some of it, I already kind of internalized Mm -hmm. or the parts of it, I didn't. And I like kind of put all the pieces together. And so then I started kind of doing that for myself. Um, And then I, I really, at that point, I really knew focus on weight loss is just not it for me as Mm -hmm. a dietitian and what I wanted Mm -hmm. to do. But I still had people come to me for weight loss. And I would always say like the scale is optional. But then of course they want to see the scale because yes. like they're coming for weight loss. Um, and I didn't, I think I, for, it was like about four months till I transitioned to actual full intuitive eating because um, I was just Because most scared. people who call a dietitian are like, hey, can you help me lose weight? 
Yeah. And I was also like, who's going to want to come see me? Right. Like, how am I going to have business? <laughs> who's going to want to work with me if I'm not offering them weight loss? Like it was such a new concept to me, but as time went on, it just did not feel right. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm just, at the end of the day, what people want is to be happy. Right. Has going on another diet again and again made you happy? Right. Has it gotten you any healthier and happier in the long run? Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm just going to focus on health. I'm not going to do this. And so I, I still remember that first client that I had that I was like, Oh my gosh, she she agreed to come see me. Like I'm, gonna, you know what I'm saying? It was like wow, and it's not weight loss, um, <laughs> but it just felt so much better. Like it felt so much more aligned, and it felt right. And I think you always have to just do what's right for you. So it's for very that, that was very brave of you. I have to say that it it was. And any dietitian that makes that change, like people will pay for weight loss. Like you could you could tell anyone weight loss. Like even if you're not a dietitian, like people it's easier would, in this culture because you're already harping on insecurities that people have. It's really sad. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah, yeah. And so and so, I think at the end of the day, you always have to do. And that, by the way, it's not me coming to say if you're pursuing weight loss or whatever, you don't have values. Right. right. I'm talking about for me. Right. Like that was what was aligned with my values and what mm-hmm. I felt was right. And so, um, yeah, I I transitioned, and then from there, it's more of like business conversation, like, and how I was able to get to where I'm at in terms of like helping people see the value of that. And then actually being able to work with, with women and helping that and, you know, helping them stop binge eating and all of that. I think that when you're talking about intuitive eating, you do have to take more time for people to see the, the understand the value of making peace with food, because um, it's so much more than just peace with food, because when you're at mm-hmm. peace with food, think about all the brain space that your mm-hmm. mind is taking now. Mm-hmm. from from living life like you want to just go to the ice cream store with your kids and like mm-hmm. if you're on a diet you're like okay I'm not gonna get the ice cream okay I'm right. sugar-free ice cream okay only one bite oh right don't have it. and then the whole time instead of just being present with your kids having the ice cream what happens is you're obsessed and consumed and worried about it's going to break your diet then you end up either having the sugar-free which is not good and then end up having licks from your kids and right. end up having coming home and then binge eating the closet because you didn't actually satisfy yourself mm-hmm. and now you're feeling gross and horrible mm-hmm. and it's think about how much time and energy that's taking so when you're at peace with food you trust yourself you're like i go to the ice cream store and if i want ice cream i'll get it and if i don't i don't and sometimes mm-hmm. you'll get it and sometimes you won't and then you'll move on with your life and you'll have this beautiful memory of being with your kids and you'll come home and you're not going to go to your cabinet because you're actually satisfied See, I'm talking a mile a minute because it's right, like, I'm just right, so passionate right. about this and want you to understand that. I think that was the piece that I had to work on in really learning to communicate the value to your life mm-hmm. and understanding that food freedom is not just about food freedom. Body peace right. is not just about body peace. It's ultimately for the purpose of being able to live in alignment with your values and to live life fully and to love yourself and mm-hmm. to care for yourself, even if you don't love your body. Right. I mean, if you love your body, awesome. But even if you don't love it, knowing that you can still live a really wholesome, amazing, healthy life and love yourself mm-hmm. beyond that. Cause your body's just one part of you. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to hear about the business side if you want to share, but I, I also wanted to hear, did you get like pushback from colleagues, family members? Like when you were like, okay, I'm not doing weight loss, like, or not really. Um, not pushback in a sense where it was aggressive. Um, but I did get pushback I think more so from people close to me than from colleagues I don't colleagues I don't think they really cared mm-hmm. at all mm-hmm. <laughs> like if anything I found new new colleagues that were in alignment with what I was doing um but with people closer to me they were kind of like but like weight loss sells mm-hmm. type thing you know and then I even had someone really close to me that it really actually it was kind of like painful I think where I was like I was trying to explain what I what I do and they're like, well, you put people on diet, you help them lose weight, da, 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 all those things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I'm trying to explain it. And they're like, well, then like, you're not a dietitian. And that was like, so hurtful. I was like, mm. what? Like, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, um, right. Again, when people close to you, it, it, it does hurt more type yeah, thing. But yeah. I think that's, it's also just so sad. And I think the world views dietitians that way. I'm like, oh, you go to mm. a dietitian to lose weight. And right. it's just so much more than that. Right, um, right. It's, it's about your health. It's about your happiness, um, really right. changing lives. So, so yeah, I did get some of that, but they like, I think if anything, I continued to explain my way and I did get a lot of pushback in just also just health at every size, what that mm-hmm. is. They're like, what right. do you need? Da, da, da. What's right. interesting though now is that it, th- they're actually like at this point, I'm seeing more and more that they're in alignment with what I say. 
Mm -hmm. Even though they resist it, I think it's like th that subconscious dripping of like what I talk Planting about and what seeds. I say. Yeah. And then at mm -hmm. this point, I think it's more of the getting what I do and actually helping them too. Right. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like I did some supervision with Evelyn Tripoli and she, and I was going to, I'm going to ask you the same question, but like, I would say like, you know, my clients are doing so well, like they really have, uh, appreciate intuitive eating. They're making amazing strides in their life. They're, ha they're opening up all this headspace, but you know what? They're really unhappy that they're fat. Like mm. They're really, really unhappy that they're fat. And I'm like, I'm, I'm failing them. Like, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? She's like, mm. no, you're internalizing it. Like, don't internalize that. Like, it's it's hard like it's a hard thing to accept like let them be this like uncomfortable in their body like recognize that like ask them to bring that to the therapist or whatever she said but like it was such a powerful thing that she said like we um we internalize it but she, she also said on that note sorry I forgot to say this that like you like somebody might come back to you in five years you're just planting seeds you know like mm. you, you know you have one conversation with someone about intuitive eating it doesn't always make such a big you know, shift, but sometimes people call you back like a year, two years later. And they're like, yeah, you were right. Like it really like hit me. Like I just needed to like live with it. You know? I think, yeah, it comes down to whatever body size somebody is. I mean, it's not their responsibility. So how can it possibly be your responsibility? And let me explain what I mean by it's not their responsibility. It's every person's responsibility to care for yourself and to, you know, treat your body in a way that's going to help it function at its best, which, you know, that's sleep, movement, like nourishing nutrient dense foods, and also being able to enjoy cake in a way that doesn't leave you feeling guilty. And when you're at peace with cake, also think about it. Like if you have permission to eat as much cake as you want, would it be treating your body well? And would you feel good having cake at every meal? Mm -hmm. You naturally would just want to want that. And so mm -hmm. it's being able to really, but you can only make those decisions that align with how you want your body to feel when you're quieting that noise in your mind and really listening. Um, and so you'll be able to get to a place where, okay, I'm having this cake, I'm enjoying it, moving on. And then I'm not going to spiral. And then you don't spiral into a binge. You just move on and treat your body well. When you're in that place, that's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. What happens to your weight that is not your responsibility. Some people, as a result, will lose weight. Some people will gain weight. Some people will stay the same. But recognizing that you need to stop blaming yourself for whatever happens to your body because it's you can't determine your genetics or if someone has, let's say, a medical condition. Or I have clients who they used to be really thin and now they're not because they're on medication. And if they were to go on their, off their medication, they would not be functioning properly. And that's, right. you know, it's not their fault. Right. And so saying, okay, what can you control? How can we process this? How can we acknowledge this? How can we learn to get to a place of neutrality? Okay, you don't love your body. Let's, how can we get from a place of, I hate my body, therefore I hate myself to one level, one level up of, okay, I'm more close to being just okay with my body and knowing that I can like myself mm -hmm. regardless of how I feel about my body. The goal is liberation, and when I say liberation, I think liberation, a lot of people like feel like it's very well, li liberal, liberal mm -hmm. liberation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what I mean by liberation is you're just freeing yourself of constantly taking responsibility for what your body size wants to do. And if anything, that's le though that mindset is what's leading you to unhealthy eating behaviors. And then if anything, long, like weight, um, dieting, one of the long-term effects of dieting is actually long-term weight gain. Mm -hmm. So by pursuing dieting, what you're really doing for many people is pursuing weight gain, weight gain. if anything, if you think right. about it. Um, and it comes back to, yeah, your responsibility is caring for yourself and feeling good and knowing that you're worthy of care because we don't take care of things we don't like. Right. If you're right. constantly hating and shaming yourself, how are you possibly going to truly live a healthy life? Guilt is stressful. Stress is not healthy. We got to start right. looking at health holistically. Food counts, nutrients count 100% but it's not all that count. And right. body size is not the determ determining factor for your health. Not right. everyone in every size is healthy. You can have thin people who are not healthy. You can have fat people right. who are not healthy. You right. can have everyone in between unhealthy, but then you could also have health people that are healthy. Everyone in every size can pursue health promoting behaviors. Right. And that does not include depriving yourself and keeping yourself hungry and being disconnected from your body. So I think the bottom line is if you're going to talk about responsibility, take responsibility for caring for yourself and know right. that your body size is something that is not your fault. 
as a result. So you're like just empowering the client to like take full responsibility of what they can control and let go of what they can't. And that's empowering. Yeah. And when I say let go of what they can, it's not just, I don't want to invalidate it and like, just let it go. Like there are conversations about it. Body Mm -hmm. images. Definitely. I think the biggest, the, the, the one that we talk about, like continue, it's a, it's not even a journey. It's like just layers and layers. There's Mm -hmm. always something to, to dig. It's not like, you know, the goal isn't to get to a place where, okay, I have, I, I'm, I am no body image, bad body image days and I'm okay with my body. Right. It's like, that's not the goal. The goal is to know how to stop getting distressed by it is to how to move on from it. Even if you do have like a diet culture thought, recognizing, okay, this is not my thought it's coming in. I'll just let it pass by and not spiral into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and know that you're, you're, you're worthy beyond your size and living life beyond your size. And yeah, like whether, and, and if it's much more deep rooted, like let's say if someone was constantly shamed as a child for their size, I mean, your brain is developing as a kid. So that's Mm -hmm. like very deeply rooted. And so therapy can be very helpful, specifically therapy from a therapist who's aware of eating disorders and body image. Mm -hmm. They can help you more. So it's not just any therapist. I definitely think getting someone who understands body image and eating disorder would be helpful, even if you don't have an eating disorder, but just someone who understands intuitive eating, even disordered eating. If you want to recommend a therapist like in Brooklyn, go for it. I'll put it in the show notes, unless you don't have anyone to recommend. It's so- well, not, I think just finding someone that aligns with you, you know, mm-hmm. so I know your, your viewers are from like viewers, listeners are from all over the world, but the bottom right. line is recognizing that a, a dietitian is also a dietitian at the end of the day. I call us kind right. of like people who do intuitive eating, like food therapists, right? <laughs> but it's true. Recognizing, yeah. yeah. But recognizing that, um, some things are, that are really deeply rooted. It's okay to have a therapist and get right. help for that so that the work you're doing with intuitive eating really works in conjunction with the work that you're doing with your therapist, the client, my clients who have therapists um, and together with what we're doing, I do find that it is just so helpful because let's say we'll get to a place of that's like really inner child work. And then I'm like, okay, you know what, this is, uh, I'm seeing that it kind of really goes into the history of things. And so I'll tell them, you know, what if you bring that to your therapist this week, come back around and we talk about it. And then let's kind of bring it full circle and talk right. about what we're doing. Yeah. And that's the more at peace you can feel with your body, the more, uh, it, more, the easier it will be to really trust it and make peace with food so that you can then live your life. Right. Totally. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the behind the scenes business stuff. Cause you have like a really thriving Instagram. And I know you said you were going to go to culinary school. Like, is that, um, were you always like really into cooking? Like everything's so beautiful on your page. Like oh, you thank your you. recipes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I did want to go to culinary school at some point. It wasn't this like big dream of mine, but I did want to go, um, at one point, but I missed the deadline to apply. It was like the only kosher culinary program. The one in Brooklyn, right? Is it still in Brooklyn? I don't even know, <laughs> but I think it was in like Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, but I missed the deadline to apply. And so I was like, okay, what else should I do? I need some stimulation. So I went to college, which is like all just a uh, fate in, mm-hmm. I really got, like, I started taking some classes in nutrition. I like loved it. Um, especially cause I loved my professor. I think sometimes it's just fate and like getting the right professor. He mm-hmm. uh, taught us the first nutrition class. And I was like, I loved it. It was just so, so interesting, so fascinating. And that's the thing. It's like, I love nutrition. I love Mm -hmm. physiology. I love like the body and how that works. And, you know, if, if you let me talk about nutrition and, you know, like triglycerides and blood sugars and all these things and food, I can definitely talk about it. The thing is, I, I, I talk about it somewhat on my page, but it's not the focus of my page because most of us, you know, the difference nutritionally between an apple and a donut, right? If it was just about knowledge, then people wouldn't be struggling. Right. Right. Totally. Yet, like when you go eat four donuts, you know, it's as, it's like it's not because you you don't have willpower or whatever right. it is. There's something right. deeper than that. And that's why I spend time in really understanding, like aligning yourself with your body, understanding why you do that. Um, yes, there's nutrition plays a place, you know, gentle nutrition and intuitive eating, and um, it has value. But if you make it the end all be all, you're not going to be living a healthy life because stressing right. about food isn't healthy. Is not healthy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So were you like, like, I know you're very active on Instagram. Like, were you, was that like a big transition for you? Like to be so out there, you have like 50,000 followers, you know, like, is that, is that where you saw like your business going? Like when you first started? Um, it was never about like 
my business going to a certain number, like on Instagram or whatever it is. It was more about, um, I saw it like as private practice. Like originally I saw it as seeing clients one-on-one. And then as the longer I was in it, the more I wanted to just do more and more things and more Mm -hmm. and more offers. And so Mm -hmm. um, it definitely was more like a broad, like a bigger picture of things I wanted to do. But I think once you're in it, you start to think of like, like inspiration just kind of comes to you. You know what I'm saying? So it was less so about, I didn't really have like a a vision of how many, I knew I wanted to grow my following, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But it was more about the people that I'm working with and helping them and how am I, how am I able to communicate the value of this to people and to help them see that dieting is not the way. And do you get like a lot of messages that like you change people's views or like you open people's minds? Like, is that something that? Yeah, it blows me away when that happens. Like I'll get a message of someone that has never messaged me before. I am not even aware that they're like liking on my pictures or whatever it is, never interacting with me before. And then they'll like message me like, you've completely like, you know, changed my life and I'm so much more at peace with food. And they'll send me sometimes a picture of like a yummy meal that they ate and I'm eating this guilt-free um, and it just blows my mind because I'm like, I, I don't technically know this person right. yet. I think when you're just continuously showing up, you don't know whose life you're impacting, but remember that we're on Instagram and we see numbers, but there's a live human being behind there. And so right. whether you have a hundred followers or a hundred thousand followers, imagine those people in a room. Imagine right. if you're only even changing that one person's life. That is so impactful. That's so special. And sometimes they'll be like, I know you probably get all these, these messages all the time or whatever it is. And I'm always like, it is never enough. Like right. every single message is really fueling fire because there are times I'll tell you honestly, like as a dietitian with diet culture and stuff, like sometimes I do get in my own head of like, oh my gosh, like, am I like, is this ever going to change? Yeah. Are we ever gonna I feel like that. I feel like that a lot. Yeah. Totally. Right. Like, are we, are we really like going to change this diet culture thing? And to a certain level, I think it's always going to be around to an extent, but I think we can, we, we can start to get louder than diet culture right. as a right. society. And we're just at the starting place of it. But with every person that takes the time to message, I don't take it ever for granted, no matter how many times someone messages me, cause it's like, like, okay, okay. Th- this yeah, is why people, I'm doing this it. This is really, this is really why I'm doing it. And this is, you know, is changing people's lives and stuff. Because again, you could sometimes get in your own head. Right. And like, and diet hmm. culture is loud. And diet culture is loud. And that's why I have so much compassion for my clients as well, because mm-hmm. I understand them. It's, I'm never going to come from a place of, you know, you should never want to lose weight or like, what do you mean? Right. I just accept your body or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. There's so much compassion to it and understanding that you desiring weight loss doesn't mean that you can't have food freedom. It's really about, I just did a post on this. It's really about what you desire most. Right. You know, do you want, do you want to continue chasing that thinner ideal? And what are you going to have to, what cost are you going to have for that? Has it made you any healthier, happier till now? Or can you acknowledge the fact that you wish you were smaller, but also, you know what, what's more important is living at peace with food, living at peace with my body being able to live life, being able to go out to eat and not have the whole day revolve around it or saving my calories or starving and then coming home and binge eating and being able to, you know, bake freely, try a new recipe, um, you know, Mm -hmm. wake up in the morning, eat your breakfast, have energy and get done what you need to get done. Um, It's funny because sometimes I remember when I was dining, I would remember every single bite of what I ate and kept Mm -hmm. eating it. And then I would also remember how much I worked out and all of that. And now sometimes it's funny, like, It'll be the afternoon or like later, later in the afternoon. I'll be like, did I work out today? What, what, what do I have for breakfast? Like, mm-hmm. I get, like I forget. Cause I'm just not, I just have it with, you know, whatever um, feels good to my body in that moment. Yes. There are some calculations and like nutritionally things like that, but that that's like all for the purpose of feeling good and caring for right. yourself, not right. to like, because you need to be good. Right. Right. Um, and then you're able to just move, move on in life. So um yeah, th- those messages, I just like never take for granted and definitely in um, making a difference in someone's life in such a big, big way. Yeah, you're doing amazing things. And I think you Thank you me. really are like a, a loud voice in the world of intuitive eating and you're like really spreading the intuitive eating message. So thank you for thank doing. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing and for joining us today. It was great. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to put all your your bio and your website and everything in the show notes so people can find you.
Yeah, absolutely. Can I also say it in the podcast itself? Yeah, go for it. What, yeah, you say your Instagram, your website, and if you want to share like a contact info. Yeah, absolutely. Can I also share a free guide if they want it? Yeah, totally. Okay. Do you want to ask me? So like, we'll take a pause and then you'll ask me. So you can, I guess, edit it. Yeah. Are you going to edit it? I don't know. 